My name is Anil Kurana. I'm a partner with a company called PRTM, which is a management consulting firm. And both me personally and our firm actually is very interested in clean energy and renewable energy and sustainability. So I think the industry is driven by profits, finally. Someone actually pointed out yesterday that the difference between green and greed is only one alphabet. So, uh, you know, industry does not think about green or sustainability on its own. It's actually the social responsibility in individuals, in companies, as well as uh, commitments that they make to the policymakers and the national, let's say, policies and standards that are set, that is actually more the driver. So you can expect industry, you know, company itself to be responsible to certainly only an extent. You know, they will not put uh, enough uh, responsibility on their own unless there is actually some degree of uh, uh, individual responsibility or uh, policies or standards set along with that. Uh, that's my belief because I've seen this enough times that uh, you know you have uh, semblance or lip service as they say to some of this but for example the auto industry uh, if there was no standards for fuel consumption in the US uh, the cars would be still SUVs but now there are fuel standards hence there are electric vehicles hence there are smaller cars and so on. So, for example, the Indian uh, culture or Indian society is not based on plenty. It's based on uh, limited supply. It's actually a supply-constrained society or economy because you have you know, 1.2 billion people, uh, land mass, you know, one-third of the U.S., and so the supply of raw materials, energy, luxury, all of that is limited, supply-constrained. So that extent, in general, the Indian, typical Indian person on the street will behave a little more uh, frugally, let's say. In, in the U.S., it's still plenty, despite uh, the crisis we're going through in the in, in a worldwide financially in the U.S. as well. It's still a world of plenty. You know, so houses are big, highways are large, country is large, and so you see that difference, of course. Now, in general, American uh, Americans. So I'm a U.S. citizen. I live in the U.S. for the last 25 years. Uh, more awareness. So definitely, the typical American is more aware of the pluses and minuses of what we do. So you probably find more. Uh, let's say people who are aware of sustainability and green are aware of what the damage is and what the target should be in the US but similarly you also find a significant part of the US population that uh, I wouldn't say doesn't care but doesn't care enough to say let's do something whereas in India I think the education awareness is limited but in general the lifestyle is such that it actually doesn't uh, you know so the per capita uh, energy consumption or the per capita uh, CO2 in India is you know one hundredth of size of the US. Um, I don't have the exact numbers, but I'd say it's, it's a fraction of that. But that's because of frugal living itself that starts off. I think NGOs do one thing much better than industry, which is they create a common voice. In industry, there's always, a, I'd call it a vested interest. You know, say if I'm an automaker, if I'm a supplier, if I'm a utility, I have a vested interest as, as a person representing the, that industry. But as NGOs have an objective that is somewhat independent of uh, uh, the industry interests. So, for example, in, in UAE these days, uh, I'm looking at the solar industry, uh, for example, and the different parts of the solar industry want to go different ways. Equipment providers want to go one way, uh, the users want to go another way, the government wants to go another way, and what will address them is some kind of, let's say it's an industry association, or an NGO, maybe something like a NGO might be better. And so that's an example where nothing exists that actually an NGO could serve a role. Similarly, in the U.S., you know, there are several think tanks. Uh, same thing in Europe. The think tanks actually help push things along. So you talked earlier about the role of the individual. I think the role of the individual is perhaps through the NGO and then the governments could listen to that voice. Well, the mix of these solutions is what we need. Because, so for example, Iceland can actually use geothermal 100% and be sustainable. Uh, the U.S. cannot because geothermal is limited. But if you look at then wind, well, wind is only possible in uh, offshore or near sea or you know in, in let's say you know 30 locations around the earth. So it by itself cannot sustain. Solar again in uh, the cold countries and the you know northern countries it cannot serve the purpose again. But you know for example this talk of Desert Tech, which is this project supposedly uh, you know maybe 30, 40 years later we'll see in northern Africa feeding Europe and feeding the Middle East and so on. So I'd say it's a mix of solutions. Today the technology costs are different, but over time they converge to the expected target, maybe slightly higher than what we pay today.
Firstly, uh, I'm an optimist in general, right? So I personally, I'm an optimist. So I like to see the positive side of things and positive side of people and you know what we do. So I look around me and uh, I find people are very aware and positive. Uh, I think we all break down when we uh, are not tuned to thinking that way. So I think education is a very important element of all of this that we perhaps underestimate. Uh, so, you know, I think on balance to your question, uh, I feel we'll uh, muddle our way through this as opposed to be clear and, and uh, um, achieve our goals. I think we'll likely muddle through, we'll make some mistakes, and 50 years from now people will be saying, I wish these guys had done better.